Um, our final uh, our final panel of the um, of the conference will address the issues uh, involving legal and operational issues uh, in dealing with piracy. We have uh, five very distinguished panelists, um, and I will leave all of the uh, important details to Professor Greg Noon. Professor Noon. Hi, uh, thank you, and uh, good afternoon uh, for the last panel of the day. Uh, as you can see, the last panel of the day is done a little bit differently, uh, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But first and foremost. We want to thank Case Western Reserve University. Uh, particularly, we want to thank Michael Sharp. We want to thank Nancy. We want to thank Tim and all the guys doing all the audio. Uh, we want to thank all the students who give up their time and give up their Friday in helping out put this on. Um, definitely a, a decidedly Canadian flavor throughout the day. And so, uh, um, and I was good with that as, a, uh, as someone who has done my training at the Canadian Forces College. and. I have a master's from the Royal Military College of Canada, so I was good with that until General Dallaire, who I admire and respect very much, brought up 1812. Uh, so, of course, that evoked 1993, which was the last time a Canadian team has won the Stanley Cup. So, it's the 20th. Boston Bruins fans are tough. And then the general told me he was a Montreal Canadien fan, so it just went downhill from there. Um, uh, and, and to kind of lighten the mood and get you get your uh, your mind going a little bit here, um, we are essentially batting cleanup. We want you to pose any questions right away. Uh, we're not going to wait and leave an allotted time at the end. Uh, we have a number of questions that I'm going to ask the panel, but please, we would like you to interject with any of your thoughts. Um, uh, there are conversations about pirate costumes and pirate parties throughout the day. For some of you who weren't here, people were talking about their four-year-old going to a pirate party and this, that, and the other thing. Uh, my 10-year-old, uh, her favorite joke involves pirates. And so it goes something like this. And I promised my Virginia I would tell this joke. This, what, is a what is a pirate's favorite place to eat? <coughs> Arby's. Okay? I know, hey, hey, it's a t it, <laughs> hey you're groaning at my 10-year-old. All right, so just, just back off. And then, and then the rest of her soliloquy goes something like this. What is a pirate's favorite state? Arkansas. Wow. And what is a pirate's favorite country? Djibouti. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I don't let my daughter say words like that in my house. Uh, it, it's Argentina. And what's a, what's a pirate's favorite baseball team? Uh, the Pirates, of course. So, so she is destined for Saturday Night Live. All right, so let me introduce the, uh, my esteemed colleagues here to give you an idea of our background so that you understand uh, who is speaking. You have their full bio in your books. But uh, Simon Barker uh, hails from the UK. Um, he's been focused on transportation and insurance-related uh, matters and on the mar marine industry in particular. Uh, in 2012, the Canadian federal government appointed him as a transportation appeal to the uh, Transportation Appeal Tribunal of Canada. As Simon was explaining to me last night, it's almost like an administrative law judge, but um, we, we don't use that phrase in, in Canada, I guess. Uh, he's also worked as a mediator with the United Nations in Cyprus and held a number of other positions and done a number of other uh, things for the UN. Um, uh, we have a Navy-heavy panel. Simon is not in the Navy, but it must be noted that his wife's name is Seaborn. So uh, that's, it's, it's all true, it's all true. Lori Blank, uh, a dear friend and colleague, is the director of the International Humanitarian Law Clinic at Emory University School of Law. She's the co-author of this book here, The International Law and Armed Conflict, Fundamental Princi Principles and Contemporary Challenges of the, in the Law of War. This book just came out in March um, and uh, is doing, uh, doing a brisk business. Uh, I was fortunate enough to be her co-author on this book. Uh, if you look at the spine of the book, it has our two names. It says blank, and then it says noon, which some people thought said no one. So they wondered why two people needed to write this book anonymously, uh, what was so imperative that they keep their identity secret. And then, of course, friends of mine thought they had bleeped out the expletive that precedes my name. So, uh, so you have this book here. So if anyone would like to take a look when, when you we're bring done. Some copies to Sure, sure. For a small fee, Ved, we can do anything. All right. Uh, Lori also, when she was uh, prior to going to Emory, was at the U.S. Institute of Peace, where she was the director of a multi-year project on military training programs in the law of war, and the co-author of another book called The Law of War Training, Resources for Military and Civilian Leaders, with another guy named Noon. 
and, uh, and she directed the experts working group on international humanitarian law while at USIP. Uh, all in all, Laurie's a prolific writer. Uh, she produces articles at a faster rate than I can read them. Uh, Mark Sloan is retired Royal Navy. He's a research fellow at Dalhousie University Center for Foreign Policy Studies and is the team leader for the Operational Responses Module of the Dalhousie Marine Piracy Project. He served for 34 years in Her Majesty's Navy and was in command of two frigates, which is uh, a fairly significant achievement. Uh, John Huggins is uh, joined the One Earth Future Foundation in Denver, Colorado as the director of the Oceans Beyond Piracy uh, Project, which focuses on promoting multi-stakeholder cooperation between industry, governments, and civil society as the most effective and sustainable way to fight piracy. Uh, John is also <coughs> retired, but United States Navy, and served as NATO's operational liaison officer to the European Union in Brussels, as well as on the operational staff at NATO headquarters. Uh, during his career in the U.S. Navy uh, as a P-3 pilot, uh, he served uh, as a mission commander for P-3 surveillance planes over the Pacific, the Middle East, and Afghanistan, and has acted as a fellow at the Atlantic Council of the United States. So that's our a brief summary of our panel, and thank you for picking up my, my pieces of paper there. That's a brief summary of our panel, and uh, as I said, we want you to, to um, for some of you have been here all day, some of you are just coming in at the latter half of the day. Uh, we want you to join in as quickly as possible. We're going to try to kind of tie up loose ends as best as we can. So one of the first things that we wanted to talk about, and I wanted to put to the group, and I'll, I'll start with uh, Simon, because he's on my immediate right here. Um, what is a pirate? The definitional uh, uh, issues that we face in, in pursuing this uh, uh, course of inquiry. So we'll start very simply there. Which allows me to ask you a question. Right. Who here has seen the first Johnny Depp movie, Pirates of the Caribbean? Okay. And so everyone is well aware of the love story between Will and Elizabeth. Right? <laughs> and so as a parent of a 15-year-old daughter, I could uh, feel for the father of Elizabeth Swan at the end when he says, but he's a blacksmith, to which she replies, no, he's a pirate. <laughs> the problem that I have had uh, with piracy since I first started uh, looking at the third law of the sea uh, convention back in the 80s was that piracy is very simply defined and yet I've heard constantly uh, today and in, in other sessions that there's some doubt about the definition. Piracy, as I understand it, as it reads in the 58 Convention and the 82 Convention, international piracy is two ships out to, outside the 12 mile limit on the high seas involving violence against persons or property. Right? And I think uh, there's a fifth one, a private end. So when I read uh, oh, and I should put this caveat out here. Uh, I don't know U.S. law. I know nothing about U.S. law, but I'm quite comfortable for the next hour and a half talking about U.S. law. Right? So take, take, take what I say with that caveat. Uh, the, the, the recent decision of the, uh, the Ninth Circuit with the Sea Shepherd, I think the judge got it bang on. I don't see the problem with the legal definition. What has happened over the years and the decades is that we have taken a populist term or a populist view of the word pirate and we put it in to a lots of different meanings. And I'll give you one quick example before I pass the microphone down and get some, some other comments. Blogs seem to be the way of the world. Right? Every day there's a blog about something from somebody. Uh, and piracy blogs come out all the time. And uh, a couple of days ago, there was a piracy blog and I looked at it in light of well, what is a pirate definition. And I thought to myself, well, attacking a ship in the Suez Canal, which was on the piracy blog, is not piracy. Because the Suez Canal is not in the high seas. When I looked at the reference in there to the fact that seven Somalis were sentenced in Malaysia, that was not piracy, because they weren't sentenced 
under the piracy. They were sentenced for shooting at a Malaysian, tr Malaysian troops that were boarding a Malaysian ship at the time. I looked at uh, the phrase about capacity building in West Africa, and that was written in the context of ship hijacking. And ship hijacking, we know, is not piracy. The only reference that I found in that blog to piracy was a reference to funding the Somaliland Coast Guard in their fight against piracy and pirates. So I think what we have to do when we have this conversation is think that the word pirate has two meanings. It has a populist meaning that Elizabeth Swan used so beautifully, although I think actually in her case she was actually correct because <laughs> he was a pirate, because he was operating on the high seas. Um, and there's the legal definition which is narrower than the populist meaning. Yes, I, I'd like to. Um, I think Hugh put the slide up in the, in the last panel of the business model. And I, and I very much adopt the business model approach to piracy, and I draw the land, par the land parallel. The getaway car driver is as much a criminal as the bank robber. Um, therefore, why is the, uh, the supplier of boats, engines, fuel, water, information, and any other aspect of supporting the actual physical act of piracy on the high seas not equally uh, liable to be, uh, to be tried for a supporting crime? And I think that the business model, for me, has, has crystallized that perspective. And it's not just the thug in a boat with a rifle. It's actually the supporting caste, which provides him with the infrastructure that actually allows him to conduct the crime in the first place. So whether you actually say they're pirates or accessories to piracy, I, I think is a, is a moot legal point, and I wouldn't dare to go there. But I think the principle is that they're all involved with the same crime. So, so let, me, let, me, let me just expand on that just a little bit more. Um, so how, how can we uh, kind of uh, uh, I I exploit this idea of, of, the, the, of what you're saying? How, how, do we, how do we make it better in the future then, well, what, using this idea? That I think 101, 101 Charlie gi gives us the way in there for, from a practitioner's point of view, in and in it gives you the wherewithal to go after the, the money launderers or the, or the, the ransom um, demanders, the ransom negotiators, the providers of engines. Where, where in that business model is the vulnerability? Actually, interdicting the pirates at sea is, an, is a massively in, intensive operation. And you might find that there are parts of that business model that you can break more easily than the seagoing bit. And once you've broken it, you've either disrupted the ability to conduct piracy, which gives you a breathing space to put something else in place um, to, to address the motive and, and means piece, um, or, or it might just end the piracy uh, completely. Of course, the danger is it will actually ch change the business model and you, you're then always playing catch up, and then how, how, do, you, how do you solve that one? Because a, a pirate is an adaptive foe, just the same as any other form of organized crime. They will adapt to the pressure. But I think the key thing is if you, if you adopt a business model approach, you can try to identify where the vulnerabilities are, or it's not necessarily true that the most vulnerable, most vulnerable point will have the greatest impact on the pirates. So where do you put your effort? Where is the most effective way of putting that, that effort in in order to stop the crime <coughs> overall, <coughs> accepting the fact that the, the solution to piracy is rule of law on land, you know, that's, and um, socioeconomic measures and all the rest of it, to break the motive uh, means opportunity trinity. I think there's, uh, there's one thing, and, and Mark sort of uh, picked up on the word, is that uh, it, it's business. It's a good business. I mean, we've, we've heard today that uh, if you want to be a, a pirate in Somalia, you're going to get a nice house. You're going to drive a Mercedes, right? You're going to have a whack of cash. I mean, the, one of the bank, World Bank's comments in 2011 was that $150 million uh, came out of the business. That's 15% of the gross domestic product for that country in 2011. So it's, it's a good earner. The occupational hazard, you might get caught. The, the, the out is you're unlikely to serve any time for it. So there's no downside to it, and there's a lot of upsides to it. Piracy uh, has been described by some as the world's the third oldest profession on the globe. Medicine's the second, right? So there's a long history of piracy, and it's a good money earner, so why would you not do it, right? I think being a lawyer is the first, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. I, I knew there was something involved in there. Uh, so John, let me, let me change course a little bit. Um, 
how long uh, must the international navies and the industries uh, follow those best management practices? How long do they must be in place to be successful in combating privacy? Piracy. Yeah, I think, uh, I think the first thing is to define what, what do we call a successful end to this game. Um, if you ask nations and international organizations, I think the answer is once you have some established maritime security. So we talk about uh, arresting pirates at sea, moving into uh, arresting facilitators, and then finally bringing some governance ashore uh, that, uh, that, that would not allow piracy to happen. And I think Hugh uh, talked about it earlier. Uh, you need just enough governance to break this business model. And, and he was talking about the different areas, and <coughs> I've heard it called the Goldilocks model, where uh, as far as uh, chaos, uh, you know, there's not enough chaos in uh, Somaliland. There's too much chaos in South Central, but Puntland is just right for piracy. So we need to have areas that look a little more like the northwest coast of Somalia with just enough governance there. But uh, industry, I think, has a different view. Um, one of the things we do is meet with many groups of people, and industry told us that a successful end to piracy is we've stopped the attacks at sea, and we can go back to security procedures that were there before 2005. Um, I personally don't think that this is gonna solve it. I think what we've seen over the last few years is the vulnerability of these ships at sea has been, been very well demonstrated. Uh, they're, they're going slow for the most part to conserve fuel or for, uh, for not making pollution. Uh, they have very small crews, maybe 12 to 14 guys that doesn't allow them to respond on the vessel. So there's a lot of things that make these ships vulnerable. So I think the answer is gonna be somewhere in between those two. I think there's gonna be some procedures that the shipping industry is gonna have to adopt on a more permanent basis. Uh, but I think you also need that little bit of governance ashore that's going to break that part of the business model. Well, and, and let me let me slow you down a bit. Assuming that we don't have a room full of uh, mariners, what is pre-2005 as far as what, what procedures were in place in 2005 that the industry wants to get back to? Right. Well, I think um, when we look at what happened after 2005, they started coming together as an industry and coming up with best management practices. And, and those have been mentioned before, but it's certain routing procedures, it's certain speeds that you want to maintain, it's extra watches on board the vessel, it is barbed wire in some cases, in some cases it's the rigging of fire hoses. Uh, another procedure which has been very effective is the, uh, the installation of citadels on board these vessels, which is basically a safe room that gives the crew some hours uh, protection from the pirates to allow a, a Navy response to happen. Uh, there's also been uh, reporting in, there's uh, the Maritime Security Center Horn of Africa, which was established by the European Union, where ships actually check in, which they, they didn't normally do, provide position reports, uh, report vulnerabilities to the naval forces so that they could track these. So uh, all those put together, though, is a very, very expensive operation. And, and uh, in our reports, we calculated that it's somewhere between four and five billion dollars a year for the industry. So they are anxious to go back to those procedures in place before 2005. And, and let's talk about the biggest item in, in all of this, the addition of perhaps uh, armed security, uh, private security firms. Um, let's kind of go through that a little bit and see where, where that takes us. What, what are the rules? And Laura, I'd like you to chime in a little bit here maybe uh, with respect to uh, use of force uh, when we start adding, adding another dimension of, of uh, um, bring your own weapons to the gunfight, which I always recommend bring a gun to a gunfight. Don't <laughs> bring a knife. Uh, so, so go ahead. Um, thank you. Well, I think, um, I, I guess I want to introduce another set of players also in addition to the private armed guards when we're talking about using force, and that's the multinational task forces that are out um, working to protect shipping and combat piracy. So we have a bunch of different players out there who are armed and using force or have some guidelines and parameters for using force. And um, the, you know, so we have to look at what is the paradigm for that use of force. And um, here we can look both at legal frameworks, UNCLOS and other um, legal frameworks, but also what are the rules of engagement. You know, the private armed guards are going to have, they have codes of conduct, they have best practices that has been developed. It's also been developed in the contractor scenario in terms of um, conflict zones, so on land, totally unrelated to piracy, but we see this developing across the board where you have situations where private entities are heavily armed and look a lot like 
militaries in some way, um, but are not part of militaries, and how do we control that use of force? And then how about the multinational uh, forces and how they cooperate? You know, with regard to the counter piracy operations, it's interesting, it falls a little bit in the middle. Normally when you think about use of force outside of a conflict situation, we're thinking about law enforcement, and the parameters on the use of force are very, very strict indeed, which, as I often say, is good, because you know, we don't want a world in which you know, um, anybody is quick on the trigger. Um, but in, that c in those cases, force can only be used where it's absolutely necessary as a last resort, resort and must be proportional to the task of stopping the threat that that individual or situation poses. In the context of piracy, um, what the international law allows is the use of force to board, stop a ship, and arrest um, suspected pirates on board. So it goes a little bit beyond what we might think of as law enforcement outside of the piracy context. It's obviously not a, a wartime footing when the use of force is a first resort, uh, but it does have its own unique place in terms of how we think about some of those concepts. If I can uh, chime in here on, on a couple of ones, because the rules of engagement uh, uh, are something I've, I've given some thought to. The difficulty I think that uh, we have in the marine world is that uh, we're the ship's at sea. It's a self-contained piece of land that's flying a flag out there in the middle of the ocean. And so the six crew members, the 12 crew members, the, the one thing about modern technology is that there are less crew crew now on a, a large ship than they used to be because the machines are doing a lot of the work. So you have few people out there and they're all alone. So when the master is looking out and he sees that small boat approaching him, he doesn't have his attorney standing on his left arm or his right arm, so he has to do it himself. And we've heard today from a number of different speakers about the need for training and education. Uh, rules of engagement uh, are something that military officers get taught about. Uh, my father was in the British Army for many years, uh, subsequently passed away, and one of, the, one of the, the things that I, one of the mementos that I have uh, from him was the card that he was given uh, when he was in Northern Ireland, which was a British Army war zone uh, in the 60, late 60s, early 70s. Uh, it was his rules of engagement for people with learning disabilities. Uh, although the card is politically incorrect because it talks about deaf people, but uh, you know, uh, it's now people with learning, people with hearing disabilities, uh, because what the British Army was were finding was that when they were trying to disperse the crowds, they would shout to people, "Disperse!" And the person with the hearing disability wasn't dispersing, and then was wondering why he had a large bruise on his butt because the rubber bullet had uh, bounced off the ground and hit him because he wasn't dispersing fast enough, and so sign language became important as a rule of engagement for the British Army in crowd control. What we're saying to our naval officers and what we're, we're having a debate as a marine industry right now is the world is changing. We can't, as much as ship owners want to go back to pre-2005 days, because that might save them a little bit of money and freight rates are so high, is you can't go backwards. You have to look forwards. And so what we need to do is we need to be training captains, masters, crews, armed security guards, as to what it's like out there in the waterway and what they're likely to encounter. As a, co as a Coast Guard lawyer many years ago, uh, I used to say to my clients, you don't want me out there on the ship, but nowadays with smartphones, satellite technology, you can call if you've got a problem, but I don't expect to hear from you. Handle it yourself. And that's what we're asking them to do. We're asking them to handle it themselves and deal with the pirates or what they think of pirates as the boat's coming towards them. I think going back to the, the, the roots of the question, Greg, there, there are a couple of issues. First of all, uh, private, military uh, private maritime security contractors are a defensive asset, whereas a uh, government-operated vessel operating under rules of engagement rather than rules for the use of force, uh, depending on what the rules of engagement are, can be an offensive asset as well. The rules for the use of force are therefore based on the, on the principles of, of self-defense, and, that, and that's how they, how they work through. The issue arose, and I, my, my particular position is that I think the industry was slow in accepting and recognizing, and then maybe accepting the fact 
that there are not enough warships in the world to control an area the size of the Indian Ocean and the Gulf of Guinea and the Straits of Malacca and the South China Sea and all, all the other areas against piracy. It's just, it's just not feasible anymore, especially with the technology that pirates are, are now deploying and the speed of the vessels they can use, the, the information that's available to them. All of those aspects have, have increased the, their ability. Therefore, the industry had to get itself a position where, accept it, where it accepted a degree of responsibility for its own security. And the analogy I draw again is a land-based one. Just because there's a police force in your area doesn't mean that you don't lock your front door and lock your car when you leave them empty. You take a degree of responsibility for your own security. You act to <coughs> reduce your, vulner your vulnerability to a crime. And, and I think that now that we've, we've moved forward down the PMSC route, now, uh, and it, it is a fact at the moment that a lot of ships in the Indian that might have employed them uh, over the last few years are not employing them because the threat has seemed to be re reduced. Uh, but the principle has been established. Um, the rules for the use of force uh, were industry generated, not government generated. There's a degree of industry self regulation there, which I think is, is a concern. But at least it's plugging a gap as we move forward. And I think the key question is okay, we've got past this particular problem, we've got a different problem in the Gulf of Guinea. Uh, where instead of the crimes being committed on the high seas, they're largely inside territorial waters, so the coastal nations have a different perspective on it uh, for, for the use of, of, um, of arms. But what do we need to do? What lessons do we need to identify now so that they're in the hip pocket, so when we get another um, outbreak of piracy, whether it's a, a high seas outbreak or using a wider piracy definition, a, a, a territorial waters outbreak, what lessons can we pick up now to apply in the future? How do we take this one forward with the industry? And that's a great segue. So, so w with respect to where we are in, in, in our food chain, what are some of the lessons that, that we've learned? What are some of the things that uh, are good takeaways? Um, I think it's, it's like most situations. I think the international community comes together to solve a crisis very well. Um, in our foundation, we use the term phase one, which is suppression at sea. And you heard the three things that were most effective, and thanks for bringing those other two up, Lori. I think, um, Private security has been an absolute game changer out there. We know that. We know that this is deterring the pirates based on their tactics, for one. It used to be they would try to come out and intimidate the crew by firing their weapons. Now they've been shot at so many times, they do what's called a soft approach. They'll come up, not show weapons, and if the security team shows them weapons, they'll wave and move on. So we know that there's an effect. The other two things are the coordinated Navy responses, of course, and then the best management practices, which we talked about. Um, and I guess it's late in the day, we can be a little provocative here, but amongst those that we talk to that are actually fighting the problem, the one thing we're not hearing is that there has been an effective rule of law response, which we think should be the final uh, way of solving this. And I think that, um, you know, is anyone actually deterred by the prosecutions that have happened? Have we prosecuted anybody higher than a translator? Uh, is there the international appetite to continue to go after these guys even when the numbers go down? Are we going to continue the investigations? We just heard that uh, the International Code of Conduct, uh, I'm sorry, the Djibouti Code of Conduct is already winding down, the IMO, by the end of 2014. So we're starting to see uh, people moving away from the problem. Uh, NATO and EU, uh, they have to make a decision on whether to extend their mandate by the end of 2014. Will they do so? Will they stay engaged? So I'll leave that on the table for the other panelists. There's a, a phrase that I, I, I learned a number of years ago that I've always liked, is that, uh, and it's those that don't know history are doomed to repeat it, right? And the Canadian experience uh, was that we embraced piracy uh, long before we were a country. Uh, in the days of uh, Newfoundland's, uh, er, er, the island of Newfoundland was a fishing community. Uh, there was a nice shipping lane right beside it that came from Europe into North America. English ships carrying furs, French ships carrying uh, lots of goodies, Spanish ships carrying lots of goodies. And uh, the Newfoundland fishing fleets, when they weren't fishing, thought, well, hey, let's go out and get plunder some, some uh, treasure. Right? Uh, the Piracy in those days, and if you read the, the story of the, the fishing admirals in Newfoundland, piracy dropped quickly when the Royal Navy showed up. When the, so when they started to venture from the European side of the Atlantic into the colony side of the Atlantic, or the New World side of the Atlantic, the pirates thought, guys here have got guns, they've got cutlasses, they've got cannons, it's not as easy anymore, so we're gonna go and find 
something else which is, because I think Mark was bang on, is criminals adapt or people adapt, right? Um, I think the biggest concern that you have or we have today is when the EU go, navies go back to Europe and when the task force, rest task force members go back, will it be business as usual? Uh, if the shipping industry goes back to its pre-2005 days, then it may well be business as usual, right? Because there'll be no incentive, there'll be no incentive for the pirates not to go out there. So I think that uh, you know, if we if we follow the trends, uh, we need to improve security practice. And if we improve improve security practices, and we have the occasional military presence, that will cause pirates, armed robbers at sea, ship hijackers, whatever we want to call them, from doing what they want to do. Uh, John mentioned prosecution a moment ago. Well, there's a lilt of cynicism in his voice. But uh, have, have any of these prosecutions had an effect? Have they had a deterrence effect? Um, or have they simply had the effect of there's X amount of people doing bad things that are no longer out there doing bad things? Uh, have they had any effect beyond just getting rid of those particular guys? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I, I think that to think that there's a set number of pirates, just like there's a set number of insurgents, is difficult to put your finger on. So we've heard there's about 3,000 pirates, but I think it's a regenerating number. So 200 are taken out, 200 are there. Uh, there is not too much else going on there economically. Um, like I said, I think the real game changer has been the, uh, the use of armed guards, which allows a defense at the point of attack throughout the Indian Ocean. And I think that the pirates know that. Now. <coughs> I think that they've gone on to other work. Um, as far as whether it creates a deterrent, I think that Somalia is a difficult place. It's hard to go in there and do surveys and do uh, different things to question people on what is actually deterring pirates. Uh, I think the UNODC is trying to do some of this work with those that are jailed in different places like Hargeisa and, and those types of prisons, but uh, we don't have that information yet. I think one of the, uh, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you a slightly uh, different perspective because my, my wife has been telling me uh, ever since I had my career change in October of 2012 and I need to start listening more and talking less. Uh, and I heard something today uh, from one of my fellow speakers that I thought was quite interesting, is that in the piracy trials that we've had so far, when defense counsel showed up, it made the prosecution challenge, or sorry, it made the prosecution's job more challenging. Well, duh, that's the job of defense counsel, to make prosecution's job more challenging. And if, <coughs> The navies of this world and the police forces of this world, with all the assets that they have available, like Interpol and all the, the rest, if they do their job properly and the person sitting in the dock is truly guilty, then that's the result that will come down the pike. And what the judge will be asked to do is, after the finding of guilt, is listening to sentence, please and figuring out if there were reasons to give the person 20 years, 25 years, five years, whether it's a juvenile and there should be another way of approaching it, whether someone should just be locked up forever, or ultimately, if the death penalty is on the books, whether or not that person should have the death penalty. So, you know, there, there is a game that we as lawyers and have set for ourselves, and what we ask is that those people that come into the game, come into the game with the evidence, with a collection of the evidence, do their jobs properly, do the jobs to the best of their ability, and the person that is left at the end of the day with the tough decision is the person sitting at the front saying, I like the story, I don't like the story, I think the story has some merit. But if the charge is laid, and this is the, the point that I, I wanted to make, if the charge is laid under piracy and there's one ship involved, or the act takes place at the 11 nautical mile mark, that charge is not going to be successful because they have not met the elements of the offense. If someone comes into the room with a case of ship hijacking, or to, this gentleman was talking about sewer and hijacking conventions, if, the, if there is a more proper charge to be laid by the state, then the state should lay it. Don't call a pirate a pirate if they're not a pirate. If they're a ship hijacker or a sea robber 
or there are, you know, someone's uh, not using the banking system correctly or there's corruption. There are plenty of other ways to attack the problem. And I think one of the things that we've learned from Somalia in the last round of piracy is that national laws need to be changed. Um, Kenya problem, and they're quite open about it, was that their penal code did not accommodate piracy as the international conventions talked about piracy. So they couldn't do it properly first time round. Second time round, they had gone back to the parliament, they had changed the Merchant Shipping Act, they had amended it, and they, they started to get some success. But you can't ask a judge to make a decision based on inadequate law. Get the law right, we are lawyers, you're training as lawyers. Lawyers have the ability to interpret the law, but they also have the ability to write the law. So write the law the way you want it, write the law the way it can be used, and use it properly. And I think that's one of the lessons that I've learned personally as a Somali refugee. Um, I think when we talk about prosecutions, uh, we've talked mostly about some of the challenges of making the case, but when you include in that scenario the use of armed guards on ships or the use of uh, multinational military forces, additional challenges can come up with prosecution, which has to do with uh, issues involving the rights of the accused in terms of how they were treated upon capture during the time they were detained either on board the ship or, and then the transfer of that person to whichever state is going to prosecute them. And all the rules that govern the use of force in these contexts, whether it's the use of force in the context of capture or the use of excessive force, what does excessive force mean, um, the nature of the conditions of treatment during the time the person is being detained, those all come into play in prosecution and can make prosecution significantly more challenging if there are substantial defenses or challenges to fair trial rights on those grounds. So. Another reason why it's very important to have clear rules for what, what are the parameters for either the master of the ship or the armed guards or the multinational forces, what are the parameters of action they're allowed to take and, and what does it mean to use acceptable force, excessive force, and so on. Um, Mark, I, I do want to go to you. You keep saying that they'll adapt. And uh, I'll open it to everyone, but uh, what, what do we see on the uh, horizon for adaption? Do you have any predictions? Take out your uh, magic eight ball and yes again. I'm going to take the question back a step. I, I think one of the key things that pirates have available to them now is information to them, a much greater extent than they've, they've ever had in the past. There is so much open source information about shipping movement. Anybody here has even had a, a trial subscription to the, um, the AIS system, which track ships through, we'll, we'll know just how much information there is there is available open source. Therefore, the pirates can prepare, if, if they think about this as a problem, to a much greater extent than they've been able to in the past. And I think that's one of the things that will drive their ability to adapt. If EU NAVFOR starts to reduce the force levels in 2014 or, or changes its modus operandi, the, the pirates are going to learn about it the day after it happens because it will be all over the world, the world press so that, that they are informed to a much greater extent than they were before. They're not picking up their information in the, in the bars of uh, Kingston, Jamaica, as they were uh, yeah, hundreds of years ago. It, the information's given That's to where them. I get my information. Well, yes. <laughs> 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 the information is presented to them on a, on a plate. So they've got, they've got that foundation to an extent that they haven't had before. Um, and I think as with any agile adversary, they will adapt to whatever is put up. I mean, there's, there's, I think there is, a lot of thinking around at the moment that, Somali, that uh, Somali piracy hasn't gone away, they're just in a tactical pause. Yeah. There's a breathing space now that which we really need to capitalize on to sort the problem out on land, but we can't do that until the Somali, the Somali security and stability situation sorts itself out. So if we're still in that situation next year, EU and Force starts to drop back, you know, the, the focus shifts somewhere else, there will be nothing stopping those pirates stepping back up, so they will adapt to the circumstances of the pirate attack. So again, we've seen them adapting as they've gone through. They, they, they've gone from uh, captain transshipment, they've started demanding ransom for hostages now, which they weren't doing earlier on. So they're adapting their, their methods of operation the whole time in response to pressure and opportunity. If you don't do anything, they'll adapt to fulfillment 
Um, I, I'm going to go out on a limb and say Somalia is probably going to be in the same state it is a year from now. Uh, I, I don't know that it's going to change all that much. So aside from tactical pause and more information, you, you noted in Guinea they're, they're doing something different than what they were doing. Um, are there any other places in the world that you see them just completely changing their business model, so to speak, like they did in the Gulf of Guinea? Picking up the, the hotspots, I think the threat from Latin and Southeast Asia, you know, they're, they're fairly, fairly contained. It's, the, the problem is, I don't think that the problem of piracy is ever going to go away. I don't support the, the, the <coughs> aim of eradicating piracy, but I don't think it's a realistic aim. I think the aim is to reduce it to a level, as with any other crime, you know, this, uh, like on land, where actually you can go and get, go back and we can get them at an acceptable level of risk of having a or being mugged on the way home from work or, or, or whatever. Um, so looking around the world, I think straight from Malacca, um, the South China Sea, it's probably reasonably well, reasonably well contained. There might be some changes there, but it doesn't seem to be happening. The, the target sales are low, slow, uh, tugs, barges, and that sort of thing, it's robbery of anchorages, that type of activity. The Caribbean, it's, it's much the same. Um, th there is the pressure which was removed from the Caribbean in terms of the anti-flood operations and the security focus was, was withdrawn from there, whether that would allow more piracy to come up into it. Because I, I personally have a view perhaps that in the, in the Caribbean we're seeing piracy being suppressed by the level of security that's focused at the, 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 the anti-drugs model. And you, you mentioned Haiti as, as a possible next step. I actually don't agree with that because I think there's so much security in the area <coughs> that it won't happen. But again, is that focus to withdraw? Um, the, the Indian Ocean, we're going to have to wait to see. We've seen them evolve, we've seen the use of um, the motherships at different parts of the East to extend the range. Are we going to see that in the Gulf of Guinea? If, if the problem gets driven further offshore, if ships are going further offshore to transship and they become targets further out, are we going to see the use of motherships out, out there? They will, that type of adaptation, I think, will be a positive thing. I think that the, uh, the one of the one of the one of the thoughts that's been bouncing around my head is uh, we talked a little bit earlier today about the root cause, uh, and uh, I think one of the root causes that we have is that the world is very quickly falling into two categories: those that have, and the bigger category, which is those that have not. And so piracy as an operational model has not changed over the years. It's a fast craft. It's a slow victim. It's, a, it's a, a waterway that's easy to get to. And so when you look at a map of the world and the, 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 the major highways, the major marine highways, they do go past the developing world. And when you have something going past your within arm's reach and you don't have it, there is a portion of your population that's going to go out and get it. And what, you've, what we found uh, from a, a a highway traffic point of view is you might have one state trooper on the I-90 for a hundred miles, but if he's sitting at a strategic location doing his paperwork, that makes people go slower. He's not arresting them, but he's there and he's a presence. If he's moving up the highway, and they tend to move on a regular basis because they're, you know, they, they don't need to do the paperwork all in the same place, and if they move, you don't know where they are. So you're always thinking, I better do the speed limit or close to it because I don't know where that state trooper is. If the world's navies in the developed world are out there doing their job, then pirates will think there might be a warship around. So I've got to think twice about this. That's the type of mentality that we've got to get out. And the difficulty we have is the NIMBY attitude. that is not in my backyard. Uh, the first question that came into minds in Canada was why do we need to send Canadian warships to the Horn of Africa when Canadians are not involved? And we had to go through uh, a discussion or a dialogue which is when you walk in to your supermarket and you see all those products on the shelves, how did they get there? And the answer is because containerization revolutionized the shipping world back in what, the 60s? I think it was the 60s. And a lot of goods that we see, that we're wearing today, that we're sitting on, come by sea in a container. And those are the ships that are getting hijacked or are subject to piratical attacks. So it is our problem. 
Grotius, if I can go that far back, uh, talked about the enemies of mankind. It's all of our problem. And if we sit here in the developed world and say, this is a developing world problem, we'll never solve it. But we have to say it's part of our problem or we're part of the solution and we need to do something. And I think it's been stated about 90% of the world's goods travel by sea at some point in their existence. Um, and, and just in case you've never driven on the highways in uh, Ohio, the state troopers are everywhere. So just so you know that. So Thank just, you. yeah, that that's the tip you need to know. Uh, John, let me, let me ask you this. So we're, we're talking about this uh, onshore capacity building. What, what role can the industry play in this? Well, one of the things we, I, I think we've seen from industry based on the calculations we've done in our reports, that they're willing to spend around $5 billion a year to protect their own vessels. But they haven't been willing to move some of that money to something ashore that's going to develop a, a capacity or a longer-term solution. Uh, I think our latest figures was less than 1% was actually put into the capacity. The rest was spent on, on Navy and uh, uh, the expensive things that uh, they're doing. Uh, one, one of the things that we've done, uh, we also work with uh, a sister foundation, and we've actually been doing work in Somalia and uh, in the port of Berbera, for example. Uh, what we're trying to do now is encourage industry to use their expertise, uh, to use their in-kind donations, perhaps, and other things, to try to build up these uh, port facilities that the Somalis feel are, are very important. They, they've identified four ports. So I think that's one thing uh, that industry can do is to get more involved in that. Um, but I think, too, in the longer run, as, as been, has been mentioned, I think that there are some things that they're going to have to adapt uh, going forward. I don't think that, that they can go back to pre-2005 levels either. So I think they're going to have to understand that they make that commitment uh, also to the seafarers, to train them, to bring them aware that they're going into a high-risk area. Uh, those kind of things, I think, need to continue. I think sending the questions back up, I think it's a very complex in terms of, of industry involvement, we're talking about in, investment in the country, maybe the grid capacity building, those kind of things. The issue is that there are so many agencies involved in the pockets of it, sometimes working towards the same end state, sometimes not necessarily being aware of it, but working towards, sometimes even working against each other. The big, bigger question is how on earth do you coordinate all this activity, whether it's in Somalia or Nigeria or wherever it is? I, I, I think that is the some ways, almost the silver bullet to this problem is coordination of, it, of this activity. So you really invest time, effort, money in building up e efficiently and effectively rather than piecemeal and suboptimal. Well, thank you. I didn't want to interject until you started on that uh, issue. Um, what has really happened is that all day we have been talking about these legal operational problems. And one thing that we keep saying is that long-term issues are going to be in Somalia on the land. And then we keep saying that at the present time, since there is no governance there, it won't happen. Let us assume that Somalia becomes a country that, like many other developing countries, uh, least developed countries, 
that it has got some rule of law, it's there. Then the question that I would ask is, where is at the present time the political will in the country to rebuild it? At the present time, the World Bank has said that the only answer to that question in Somalia is to take care of Somalia on land. And I, I have a question because developed countries, time and again, have pledged to help countries to develop, give technology that is proper, and it has not happened. Every pledge that has been given time and again has not been given, not been realized, those promises are <coughs> broken, and a public-private partnership that John is saying that the industry might do, uh, and then the question raised uh, how the coordination is going to happen within all, with all these agencies. So I think it's a pretty grim prospect that uh, the naval presence is going to go away, armed security guards are pretty expensive, accountability is not there, so we might have difficulty there. And then we talk about the land, and for land capacity building, we talk all of us, but how much money is it going to be needed? How effective it's going to be on that land? That is the issue that I would like to seek my experts, friends, to tell us. Can I jump in there? No, no absolutely. Uh, I think the um, solution is uh, like a five-fingered hand. There's a little piece of puzzle everywhere. Uh, I don't believe the, the Marine police would ever, or should ever disappear. Uh, the ideal situation would be, uh, as you know, one of the one of the subjects on the agenda for the Dubai conference uh, next week is funding the Somali Arab Coast Guard. Right? Is that you want the coastal nation to step into the breach and look after its own territorial waters, and then leave the high seas in effect in the problem of Somalia laid out. Well, the whole different terms now, but it's. Uh, leave the high seas for freedom of navigation and a warship of any nation can pull in a pirate if and when that takes. So I mean that that concept I think is out there. It's been out there for a very long time and it should be allowed to work. So you know the question is capacity building for coastal authorities, coast guards, to look after their own robbers, pirates, Uh, I don't think it's correct to say that uh, people are not going to the parts of the world to help. I, mean, I know that uh, the World Bank has various consultancy teams. Uh, Trade Logistics is one where they, you know, they send people over there to help. I think the, the hardest thing for a lot of the teams is they go there, they offer suggestions, they, you know, the money is left. And then they, they leave, and then the question sustains over. Right? And I think that's where we have some problems, is not the, the going in and helping, it's the once you're leaving. Uh, and is that going to be the same? Right? Uh, I, 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 I put it out there. I'm, a, I'm an optimist. I've always been an optimist. Right? Uh, and I think that uh, pirates are like any other. They're just part of society, right? Uh, that we we have a criminal justice system, we have an international criminal justice system, we have a domestic criminal justice system. Uh, I think that we as lawyers can write our laws better to achieve the purposes we want. I think we can teach our warships and our ships masters to collect evidence in a way that the prosecutors can use it. Uh, I think it's correct that Somali pirates uh, are tried in the region and not brought out of the region because of cultural differences, cultural norms, well, what people feel to be right or wrong. Um, equally, I mean, I, I, I accept that if someone kills four Americans on a sailing vessel, that there's a need to repatriate those people to America to stand in justice. Right? But then the question is, Justice for who? You know, uh, why would you 
charge the lies of the murder, bring them to Virginia, where you could have tried them evening in Mauritius or the Seychelles or in Tunis. Right? So I think the, the regional approach is correct from the Dutch's point of view. Uh, and I think that a dollar spent wisely or focused can go a long way than a hundred dollars just thrown at someone. Um, so I think there is there is there is hope. I don't think it's the, the dark picture that we we thought that it was going to be, but I do think that we need as a society, as an international society, to say pirates at sea are are symptomatic of a deeper problem. What is that deeper problem, and how best to attack it? Is that U.S. aid? U.S. aid? Is that Australian aid? Is that Canadian aid? Is that a mixture of all? Um, why can't we go to Africa and help? Right? Because if the ability is in the developed world and the developing world are asking for it, take it. You know? uh, partnerships do work. I'm not sure whether it's private sector or public sector. International partnerships do work. That's why I mean, I've been uh, very impressed at just how much Cape West and Duke go abroad. You know, because you, so bottom of voluntary work seems to go a long way. But uh, what happens after the fact is the concern. Sustainability is huge. Yeah, I think. Um amazingly enough, I think there's opportunity. I mean, it's been since 1991, but I think that. What has created the opportunity, strangely enough, is the piracy issue. It has focused international attention there, international effort, and it has uh, it made it an, an, a, a sense of urgency. Um, I think we've seen the first elected government uh, that was elected in September. Uh, you've heard about the Dubai conference. The other thing we hope will happen, as of now it's on, is that all the regions of Somalia will sign up to an agreed maritime strategy, which I think is really important uh, to end the problem we're talking about here. But um, I think that uh, you know, now is a time, I think, that we should take advantage of that. One thing, again, to be just a little provocative one more time, is uh, historically, all of the aid and all of the decisions have been funneled through Mogadishu. Now, Mogadishu controls a very small part, or historically did, a very small part of that country. We ignored Somaliland, Puntland, Gamaldug, uh, some of these other places. So uh, we have left them alone in a sense, and, and um, uh, some people diplomatically are not even allowed to say the word Somaliland, so they'll say the northwest coast of Somalia appears to have no piracy and appears to be able to stop that. But uh, we have not focused on that because the, the sole focus has been through Mogadishu, and if you believe some of the UN reports, uh, up until last year up to 80% of those funds were just disappearing, and yet we continued to ship money through there. So I think what's needed is kind of a different approach. We invest in uh, small entrepreneurial companies, things like honey, uh, jewelry manufacturers, Somali fair fishing. So these are some of the things that, that we've been doing to see if we have some scalable uh, economies that we can invest in as a private sector rather than straight development aid. Yeah, let's take a question here. Thank you very much, it's been fascinating. I think this might segue well with what Mr. Barker was just talking about. Oftentimes I discuss with my students at Baldwin Wallace the topic of climate refugees, and we frequently talk about the QDR, the Quadrennial Defense Review, and how the Pentagon is talking about, for instance, the rise of climate change being a threat to coastal communities, and really the lack of a legal framework internationally to deal with people who have been displaced by natural disasters, floods, droughts famine and so forth, whereas we do have systems in place to deal with people who have fled from conflicts, genocide, war crimes, and so forth. Going forward, if we are going to continue to see a rising threat along our coasts to all of these communities, do we expect to see a rise in piracy? And have we thought about what to do in that kind of situation, too? Thank you very much. If I pick up on it, and again, I revert back to what Hugh Williamson was saying earlier, and that one of the one of the precursors of piracy is, is attacking refugees. And, and if we have environmental refugees, then that, that has the potential, not necessarily the, the actual, but certainly the potential, uh, to provide an opportunity that the ill-disposed will exploit, um, as, whether it's high-seas piracy or armed robbery in, in territorial waters. So I think from that perspective, and that this was again the, the Haiti um, example, yes, there, there would be a very real potential. Um, we saw, um, even in the Mediterranean, some of the refugees from the former Yugoslavia being, being attacked and then also in, 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 in stolen from them. 
So whether there, wherever there is that flow and there is opportunity, uh, if someone's in the right position, they will exploit it. So yes. First, I have to ask Professor Noon if his daughter has told him the pirate's favorite kind of socks. Argyle. <laughs> I wonder. No extra charge. I wonder, Mr. Huggins and Mr. Sloan, given their naval backgrounds, that they're familiar with the World War I concept of Q ships, and if with a reduction in the international naval presence, uh, that concept might be reintroduced and adapted. It looks like uh, Captain Sloan remembers. Maybe he could tell us. I doubt that. For those who didn't know, a Q ship was a, was a merchant ship with its armaments disguised. The U boat would surface, uh, demand that he stop so that they could board and, and, and sink him. As he did so, the Q ship dropped the, the, the gunnels, the, the weapons were exposed, and they sank the U boat. It was, a, it was a scheme that worked quite well for a while. Um, would it work against uh, Somali piracy? Or anyone? So, or, or, any or, any, or any piracy? Um, it could work. But I'm not sure it's a route we'd necessarily want to go down. And are, are there not better ways to solve this problem? Because again, it's addressing the symptom rather than the, rather than the cause. And if, if you accept that, as with any organized crime, piracy is driven by motive, opportunity, and means, one of the ways of reducing opportunity is to reduce vulnerability in a potential target. And that is probably an easier way than, than decking a, a ship out as a, as a Q ship. And, and taking the pirates on, on that way, I think, would be, would be my perspective on it. It's a, uh, make a good movie, <laughs> but, but I'm, not, I'm not sure it's one that I, that I personally would, would see being particularly successful or desirable. I, I would say you already have them. It's called private security teams. Uh, they approach the vessel, and it's, it's not a fair fight. Uh, you have ex-Special Forces guys 40 feet high on a stable platform against a skiff. It's, it's not very close, and I think that's why you've seen the tactics change. Um, I think, too, the one thing you don't have, though, with private security, and we haven't really talked about, they're not there to arrest people. So the law enforcement aspect is not there if the navies pull out. So that's what you're missing. You're, miss you're meeting force with force. And, and I, I agree with the Commodore that that's not the long-term solution that anybody's looking for. I think the, uh, the other issue, too, is, uh, you know, why hide the gun? I mean, the, the whole point of uh, if the pirate, which is in a small boat, is going up against a big boat, right? The, and the, the pirate knows that the uh, subterfuge is not going to work, and, you know, the, they're not going to be able to climb up that huge ship because no one's going to put a ladder down. And there's a guy at the top that's got a gun. Then why go up there? It, uh, the, the, the deterrent aspect of it from the law enforcement point of view is that the, the person's out there with a weapon. The, if the warship's out there or the policeman's out there, you're not going to want to go out there. Uh, so, you know, it, this is not, uh, it's not a case of uh, taking the war to the pirates. It's not a pirate war. It, it's, it's, a, it's a law enforcement issue, and we should think of it as a law enforcement issue, and uh, that what we're seeing on the waterway is simply a symptom of something that is deeper that we need to address. I, I think, I actually think we go the other way. I think maybe mounting some fake guns might act as a deterrent uh, <laughs> than going the other way on that. Laurie, and then I'm gonna just, go to questions. Um, just one point uh, to follow up with regard to if the navies pull out. Um, it's my understanding, and there needs to be, I think, much more development on this issue, that the master of the ship, even on a private vessel, has some authority with regard to Maybe law enforcement is too strong a word, but if somebody were to attack the vessel, they have some authority to detain at least briefly while they figure out what they need to do with this person. This is not something that has really been addressed. Um, and I know there is some discussion, certainly um, in the Piracy Working Group, uh, to look at what, what is this power that the master of the ship has? Does it change if he or she has armed guards on board? What is the extent of it? How long does it last? And so on and so forth. So I think that may be something that comes into play eventually if the navies pull out and there needs to essentially be some gap filling to kind of flesh this out and have some best practices that, of course, are in line with the existing legal framework. But since nobody's really pondering what that legal framework is to try to build it out. Other questions? Uh, one of the weaknesses of the 
international justice system is that the ICC doesn't have a force to arrest people. It, it's got to depend on other people. Uh, remember Yugoslavia and other, other scenarios. Um, so um, without that capability, it's difficult for it to implement um, uh, any, any sort of uh, process in which it can bring people to, to court. But uh, last year, I, I chair, I'm the deputy chair of the Defense Committee in the Senate. Last year, we passed legislation, what was called Shiprider, uh, in which um, Canadian police are on American Coast Guard ships and vice versa uh, on the Great Lakes and on both coasts, so that if somebody is running through uh, the border, uh, we, we don't break off this, the chase, we keep on going. So this American ship, as long as it's got a Canadian um, uh, Canadian policemen on board can continue in Canadian waters and arrest uh, and, and prosecute. So what about because of the vacuum that potentially is going to arrive, is there not a capability of, of, of having the UN attempt to introduce a capability of that nature within the international sphere of, of having ship riders, of having actual uh, police type of a force, not not the, just the security guys, but an actual police recognized international police person, uh, a sort of a variant of Interpol or some damn thing, on those ships, so that yeah, once they get them, they can arrest them and put them through the appropriate processes that are a grave concern. Can I, can I hold your time there for a moment? And Ash has uh, two, two fingers to add. And then it just so happens that uh, the International Maritime Organization. Uh, adopted a draft international instrument that does that very thing, that it, it would provide for uh, what we call ship riders uh, in, the, in the various contexts to deal with, with law enforcement uh, situations. Uh, and and you, I, you could do that in, in this situation, but there's a draft out there, I wrote it, um, <laughs> uh, based on you know, what we've done in the context of, of, of the, with the Canadian one, which was a, a, uh, the, the Canada-US one that the general was just talking about, which was a follow-on to the stuff we did in the, in the Caribbean over the last 20 years. And I, did I not see something in the code of conduct for West Africa that says something similar? Yeah, and it, it comes from that same experience. Right. The, 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 I mean, I understand why it makes sense in a regional document, right? Because, uh, and I, I forget the, the number now, but uh, there was a lot of water on this planet very little land, right? And the, the shipping lanes uh, around the globe are well known, right? Uh, but the difficulty that you have with the ship riders is uh, Panamanian flags, Cypriot flags, you know, the Liberian flag, the, the, there are German ships, there are French ships, British ships. I mean, the nationalities are all out there. And so the concept of Article 100 and the concept of the law of the sea was if you are out past the territorial waters, 12 miles an hour, and you are engaging in political activity, uh, or you know you have a flag flying the mast that's not a recognized national flag, right? the Jolly Roger or what, whatever you want to call it, and you are in effect a stateless ship, then any warship of any nation on the globe can pull you in. And there doesn't have to be this jurisdictional link that you can take that international crime and take it dom domestically to any country and try that person for that international crime. The difficulty I think that we have is, and, and the, this is what I, uh, the point I was trying to make when I started out is, I don't think there's a problem with the definition of piracy in the Law of the Sea Convention, because it's exactly the same in the 58 Convention, which the US has signed, and it's, very similar to the one that we had back in the 1920s with the League of Nations, other than the fact that we didn't have a reference in that document to the high sea. So it was, it was any sea crime uh, we were talking about. Uh, the, the difficulty that we have today uh, was the problem that Kenya identified and other countries identified is that people don't take, we sign the international conventions, we ratify the international conventions, we talk about embracing the international conventions and international customary law, but we then don't go the next step and put those words 
into our domestic legislation. And so when a judge is sitting in a Canadian courtroom or an American courtroom or a Kenyan courtroom and the prosecutor is saying the law of piracy, the judge trained in domestic law goes, but it's not, it's not here. You're mm -hmm. asking me to do something that I cannot do because the, the statute of my, the law of my land, our constitution, does not allow me to do it. Which is my point to all of the young law students here is you have the ability to interpret the law, you have the ability to read the law, but you also have the ability to write the law. Write it like Mauritius has done for a particular purpose and use it for that purpose. Right? And don't try and put a round peg into a square hole. John? Yeah, I think one of the, one of the things I've heard mentioned is this, this concept of universal jurisdiction where anyone can prosecute has kind of turned into the, since anyone can prosecute, no one will prosecute. It's, it's an expensive proposition. It is long term. These are long sentences. And there's no guarantee that the person will go home at the end of the sentence. There, there might be some legal restrictions on, on that. I think, though, that the problem is, is detaining and arresting these people. No one really has an appetite to do that. I think a, a merchant vessel has no appetite to bring these dangerous people on board. It's also a very dangerous thing to do. 80% uh, of those even that are captured by navies are, are cut loose on the shore. And uh, this, this legal detachment kind of was a, a thing, and, and my colleague from Kenya might know more, but as we understood, there was a certain amount of time that you had to get this person before a magistrate. If you had a, a Kenyan arrest at sea, then you had to immediately leave the Navy patrol area, an entire vessel, to bring these suspects in. And, and uh, I, th I guess we could talk about that at cocktails if that's true. But uh, it's a very difficult thing, and there's no great appetite to arrest. Well, uh, I'll tell you one anecdotal story that was told to me by a Canadian commander of one of our warships uh, that was deployed in, in the, in the, uh, off the Horn of Africa. Uh, when faced with a boatload of Somali pirates, his concern was not collecting evidence. It was not where did he send them to be prosecuted. It was they were hungry, so they should open the galley and give them, a, give them some food and how much gas did they have in the motor, because he was sending them back to shore. Minus the weapons, they were gonna keep the guns. But the, the, he did not want them to run out of gas between his ship and the shoreline, because then he would be tasked with search and rescue, and he'd have to go and help them and save them. Right? So the, I mean, the concern for the commanders out at sea, the rules of engagement, are we're still dealing with human beings. Now, they, they're admittedly, they call themselves combatants, but they're human. And, you know, when you, when you have 12 of them sitting in the dock facing charges, justice is being performed. The question is for who? You know, so if, there's, if someone has died out at sea or someone has been killed by a pirate, you can understand. Justice for the victim, justice for the pirate, justice for the country involved. Uh, I think the difficulty we have is because we're dealing with an international crime on the high seas, there is this key link between our nation and that situation. Uh, that, 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 whether it's tenuous, or, there's a complete D-link. And so if there's a D-link, we go back to the nimi, NIMBY, right? I don't want it. It's not my problem. I don't want to deal with it. But it is our problem because we all signed on to the Law of the Sea Convention in 58 and the high seas, or we signed on to the 82 one. We say it's our problem because we, as mankind, have made it our problem. Right? And the difficulty is we don't want to then go the next step. Mauritius are going the next step. But they've done it in a very logical way is they saw the problem, they changed the law, and now they're prosecuting under new law. Which makes you wonder, as a member of the judiciary, <laughs> is that's a foregone conclusion. Why not plead guilty and just throw away the key, right? Because the law has been written to put them away, right? Let's go here to a uh, question here. Uh, two things. First, <clears throat> I say with some trepidation, considering the jokes around here, uh, September the 19th is international talk like a pirate day. So <laughs> save it for, for September the 19th. <laughs> yes. Uh, Mark, you'll be on CBC for that one. Okay. Uh, but my, my more serious point is that we've concentrated a great deal on the threat to the international community from the, the pirates and in the weak, 
weaker coastal states. But what we haven't look, looked at is one of the precursor events, and that is when you have a failed or failing state that cannot look after its 200-mile economic zone in coastal waters, there is a tendency for illegal fishing, illegal dumping for the international community to go in there and start exploiting it. And that has been one of the major precursor events. So we've talked some uh, sometimes about uh, an international mandate that maybe the United Nations Security Council has got to recognize in a Somalia or someplace like that that, all right, if you can't look after it, we will send uh, forces in there to keep not only the, the pirates from getting in there, but also to keep the illegal fishing, the illegal dumping, and all of the illegal activities that the international community will go in and take advantage of. And how you actually put that mechanism in place to avoid the piracy from taking place in the, uh, initially. Go ahead, uh, John. This actually came up in several contact group meetings, and uh, believe it or not, one of the messages back was, well, we might be fishing there, but since there's no EEZ, it is simply not illegal. And I thought, well, okay, maybe legally, but you know, is that really the way we want to do this? I mean, we'd love to see a commitment from nations that they will not fish in Somali waters until they declare their EEZ. And as, as difficult as that is, with all the different pieces of Somalia, uh, the resource sharing and the EEZ is a very difficult issue, and it'll probably be many years before it's solved. So, uh, uh, you know, we'd, we'd love to see some commitment from the international community to protect that zone until it can be formally declared. But I, th I think it goes to first principles as well. It came up um, earlier on that one of the, the background reasons to Somali piracy was the, uh, the reaction to toxic dumping in their waters and to illegal and un un unregulated fishing. Um, I mean, it, Hindsight's a wonderful thing, but actually if the international community had recognized the problem then and stepped in to stop it, would we be where we are now? No, the answer is no, because the rationale for a lot of that early piracy would have been removed, therefore would it have escalated to the, to the type of piracy we saw at the height of the Somali problem? And I, I, I certainly think from an operational responses point of view, that there's a, actually a responsibility for the international community where a state fails and clearly cannot look after its own, its own waters to s for the UN or an organization to step in under an international mandate to say, we will look after this for you while you get yourself sorted out and then take it, take it forward from there. Now, it's, it's lovely in theory, the practice, as you say, might be might be a great, much greater challenge, but I think it is part of an important principle. Okay, we have, uh, we have five minutes left, so, so we'll take one, one quick question. And, uh, and before I turn the microphone over to Ash, uh, after Ash goes and uh, any response to his question, but I, I want the panelists to start thinking about where do you think we'll be, again, taking out your crystal ball, where do you think we'll be in three years, five years, ten years? Not where do you hope we'll be, but, but realistically, uh, where do you think we'll be? Mine isn't a question. It's a, it's a reminder of something we haven't yet talked about, but uh, two things with regard to the S Somali pirates' excuses. Uh, the Secretary General of the UN had a report out not too long ago that um, cast great doubt on the, the realities of the, quote, illegal dumping and illegal fishing. Uh, so I think one has to be very careful about that. But on the illegal fishing, the, the, fishing, the, the FAO has done a very strong, uh, basically a port state control on IOU fishing to the extent that there you have a, a fishing vessel that is engaged in IU fishing anywhere, that uh, the party to that is, is enabled, in fact required, to prevent the fish from being landed in that port. So it takes away all the economic incentives associated with that. Uh, so that's, there, I mean, there are things that are going on in that regard. And the other thing is, you know, regard to your question or comment with regard to what you heard at the contact group with regard to the EEZ, to me that's irrelevant because there, there is a 19, I think it's 1980 Somali law of a 200 mile territorial sea. And from the standpoint of, of the domestic law, how you look at it, it's illegal to fish at 200, regardless of whether you choose to characterize it as an EEZ, which the UN Security Council has done, or a TS, it's there. And you don't even have to worry about this, this new hidden 1989 line. So, I mean, I, I think that you've, the combination of those two things are available as sources. And finally, just one comment, one we have, thing we haven't talked about, but which is essential, is that increasing the capacity of the coastal states, whether it be in West Africa or whether it be in the Horn of Africa, of, of patrolling and, and 
providing law enforcement in their own waters and, and, and near shore areas. A lot of that's going on, but that's the key, I think, once you, you do that. Mark, uh, let's start with John. Go ahead. Yeah, first, uh, just a, a quick response. Uh, if you notice in my response, I didn't say that the illegal fishing led to piracy. I'm just saying we shouldn't do it, which I think is, is, is uh, any country's right. Um, it's also in best management practices that fishing boats should not approach within 200 nautical miles. Interestingly enough, it's one of the four mandates of the EU NAV is to monitor fishing. We've been asking for the stats for four years on what that is, but uh, we haven't been able to get them. So, you know, someone is, is tasked to look at that. And uh, I think I'll turn it over to Mark because I haven't yeah, had time to so think about we've my been next given the question. Two minute, we've been given the two-minute uh, sign, okay. so there are four of you, so let me well, do Mark the math. Mark has a wrap-up speech I think he's getting four, ready for. Five. Okay, you get about 30 seconds each, so that's the way my math works out. So what's your prediction? What's your prediction I, where we're going to I think that they will extend the NATO and EU mandates for another two years. I don't think that necessarily means that you're going to have that many ships because there's many missions that are under-resourced uh, from NATO and EU. I think that uh, you're still going to have, you have right now some privately trained Navy forces within Somalia, I don't think you're going to have any capability there or the, the capability of the region. So I think we're going to have to maintain BMP. We're going to have to maintain uh, some Navy presence there over the next two years. Okay, Mark? I agree for the Indonesian. I think the Gulf of Guinea, I, I'm not sure what progress they're going to make there. Um, it's a different problem because it, it is so complex in terms of the relationships between the coastal states. Uh, the, the levels of corruption are so high. I think Ni Nigeria is still the, uh, the, most, the most corrupt state in the world in, on the list. And until you solve those problems, you know, you, you're not going to solve the piracy problem. There has to be political will and there has to be a, an overall security strategy in order to, to sort the problem out. Okay. Lord? I think um, with regard to the multinational forces, we're going to see continued development of uh, coordination on things like use of force, detention, transfer, as the need arises. We've seen that on the land version when we look at coalition forces in Afghanistan have, as conditions have changed, as states' appetite for being involved in different things has changed, we see, well, we're not detaining anymore or, or this or that. So I think we're gonna see some continued development of those. Simon, 30 coordinations. seconds. Caveat, I'm an optimist. Uh, <laughs> I now have 25 I, seconds. Okay, I see, <laughs> I see joint uh, international navy uh, domestic coast guard operations in the territorial waters in off the Horn of Africa. Uh, I see the Law of the Sea Convention as a package deal unamended. Uh, I don't think that Holy Grail will ever be touched. Uh, I see the U.S. Senate passing uh, uh, or making a decision to ratify the Law of the Sea Convention, or having done that. Uh, I. <laughs> Uh, I see the uh, Romeo Dallaire School for Children uh, flourishing in <laughs> Central Africa and uh, all of us uh, going there to teach them about uh, things that they shouldn't do to avoid piracy. Uh, fun? With his son. With his son as a, chi as a guest speaker. Uh, and I, uh, I see problems uh, around the world, heretical problems, sea robbers, uh, hijackers still occurring. Uh, and I see a need for, and I see domestic uh, legislators changing their laws to I better reflect. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And, and, an, and an optimist. And and and, and with and that that's said, my future. Th there you go, on time and under budget. If you can join me in uh, in thanking all of them. Well, and thank you, Greg, for. The uh, final panel that we do almost every conference is a roundtable, and it takes a rare talent to keep it going the way that Greg has. And so good job, and good job to all of you. Thank you. Um, so two-minute closing. I look around, and I see a lot of exhausted faces. I feel exhausted. There's a, been a lot of brain food today, a lot to chomp on, and um, it's been terrific. So I, I took a little excursion with um, General Dallaire and prosecutor and the judge and Melina Stereo to do a quick uh, radio broadcast of um, Talking Foreign Policy. And we made it back in time for this uh, panel, which was fantastic. Um, and that Talking Foreign Policy broadcast, for your information, will be broadcast Tuesday evening at 8 o'clock on WCPN 90.3 FM here in Cleveland and worldwide over the internet. Um, I want to also thank Nancy 
Pratt, who's never here when I thank her, but hopefully she's hearing over the monitor over her shoulder. Um, Brian, who I see in the back of the room. Ray, who's probably running around setting things up. Um, I want to thank our co-sponsoring organizations, especially the Wolf Family Foundation, our panelists, our panel chairs, and especially our keynote speaker for a really wonderful luncheon speech. Thank you. Um, this morning, the Mauritius prosecutor, Reshma Bikari, said that we had entered a new legal era when it came to piracy. And I think that was a fascinating thing to launch us off on, that thought. Um, and basically, the resurgence of piracy in modern times has led to new law, a lot of new law. In uh, the context of my recent book, it's a, it's a Groshen moment, really, um, for international law. We've heard today about how land-based acts are now covered in piracy. Nobody would have thought that, I think, uh, until recently. Um, recently, there was a prosecution for the mere possession of piratical equipment under universal jurisdiction new precedents that have really far-reaching implications. During our radio show, we talked about how the recruitment of child pirates may be prosecuted in the future as a crime against humanity, the way the ICC and the Special Court for Sierra Leone have been prosecuting the recruitment of child soldiers. That will be an interesting development. And then what we've heard in this last panel is the possibility of universal jurisdiction for reverse piracy, the excessive use of force, the mistaken use of force, dealing with the problems of the solution of piracy, especially when it came to the private contractors. Well, the title of our conference was Endgame. And I'm sorry to say, from listening to the final panel and all the other presentations, we're not quite there. It's not quite the end. Uh, but we're getting there. We've come so far since 2008. And especially, Simon, when I hear your very optimistic <laughs> forecast for the future, I think we are getting closer. Um, notwithstanding the fact that I think that those ships are going to be drawn down, especially once the bombs start falling in Iraq, which are likely to happen. I mean, it's Syria. Um, thank you. No, no, not Iraq. <laughs> Been there, done that, Syria. <laughs> Well, we at CASE, uh, my students, the professors, the academic consortium that involves many of you um, who were involved in our experts meeting yesterday, will continue to work with the UN, the foreign prosecutors, the Interpol, the international experts, and we will continue to wrestle with these issues and try to facilitate responses uh, to slowly bring piracy to heel. So one last round of applause for our panelists, please. then an even bigger round of applause for you, the audience, who have sat through all of this and asked such great questions. For you, the audience, um, there is a reception immediately following this in the rotunda behind. For the speakers, you need to go and change because the bus boards for your dinner promptly at 5.30 p.m. And with that, I bring this conference to a close. Thank you. Thank you.